Maybe they got distracted. <laughs> you turn bonds into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. tuning in on live stream welcome we're blessed to have you with us and uh, those of you that have made the trip to come down and join us bless you let's uh, open it with prayer guys father we just come to you lord and we thank you once again that lord you've given a, us a place to come together and to gather in your name lord and lord to give you the honor the glory and the praise lord to give you all those that are so due to you lord and Lord, we just ask, God, that you would use uh, tonight, Lord, in us, Lord, to just stir up, you know, our affection and our love and, Lord, just our yearning and, and longing for you. I pray, God, that you would strengthen those areas of our life, you know, that deal with the things that we long for, that we wouldn't have any attraction, Lord, to the things of this world, Lord, or the things of the flesh. But, Father, just a longing and desire, a hunger, Lord, and just the thirst for you and for the things of you and your kingdom. And, Lord, we pray that you would just take this time to refine us, mold us, and to shape us. Give us a love for you that cannot be shaken, Lord. And just an inclination towards you, Lord, in all things. Thank you for, Father, who you've brought. Thank you for who you will bring still, Lord. And let us just have a time of great study, great worship. And, Lord, just a, a rooting and a grounding in the right foundation, Lord. Righteousness, wholeness, Lord. We love you. We praise you. We pray for those that are hurting, Lord, physically, spiritually, and emotionally. We pray for a wholeness, Lord, just, you know, Diane's family, Lord, as they've had to deal with the death of a family member. And Lord, thank you for Caleb's recovering and the success of the surgery. Pray that you just continue to be with him as he recovers. We pray for Denise's nephew, Lord, uh, just dealing with COVID-19. and We do pray, Lord, I pray, Lord, that for this fellowship, that you keep us healthy, Lord. And, uh, and just keep the virus, you know, according to your purpose and plan, but keep it, uh, keep it away. We might be a testimony in that way, Lord, of just your protection and your hand upon us. We love you, Lord. We are just very thankful, Lord, for how good you are to us. Even when we're not so good, you love us still. Be with us now as we just worship you and study your word, Lord. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Great is your faithfulness, great is your faithfulness, you never change, you never fail, oh God. 
true are your promises. True are your promises. You never change. You never fail, oh God. So we raise up holy hands to praise the Holy One who was and is and is to come. Yes, we raise up holy hands to praise the Holy One who was Wide is your love and grace. Wide is your love and grace. You never change. You never fail, O oh God. Wide is your love and grace. Wide is your love and grace. You never change. You never fail, oh God. So we raise up holy hands to praise the Holy One who was and is and is to come. Yes, we raise up holy to praise the Holy One who was and is and is to come. You were, you are, you will always be. You were, you are, you will always be. We raise up holy hands to praise the Holy One who was and is and is to come. Who was and is and is to come. Watch your stand. I search the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. And you came along and put me back together. Every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all. You still call me friend. Cause the God of the mountain 
stands in all of your name your mighty love stands strong to the end you will fulfill your purpose for me you won't forsake me you will be with me here i am god arms wide open pouring out my life gracefully broken all to jesus now all to jesus now holding nothing back holding nothing back i surrender i surrender i surrender i surrender Jesus now holding nothing back holding nothing back I surrender I surrender I surrender I surrender Befriended by the King above all kings. Surrender, surrender to the friend above all friends. Invited deep into this mystery. Delighted, delighted by the wonders I have seen. This will be my story. Savior, you always 
a love that came for us, humble to a sinner's cross. You broke my shame and sinfulness. You rose again, victorious. Be lifted higher, be lifted higher, 
be lifted higher. So let your name be lifted higher. Be lifted higher. Be lifted higher. So let your name be lifted higher. Be lifted higher. Be lifted higher. And let your name be lifted higher. Be lifted higher. Be lifted higher. You are stronger. You are stronger. Sin is broken. You have saved me. It is written. Christ is risen. Jesus, you are Lord of Savior say, thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray, finding in thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left the and stain, he washed it white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find thy power and thine own can change the leper spots and melt the heart of stone. Jesus paid
his presence be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening in your coming and your going in your weeping and rejoicing he is for you he is for you so much for the many blessings you pour out on us day by day, minute by minute. Father God, if, if forgiving us was all that you gave us, it would be enough. But you pour out riches upon riches, Lord. Every good and perfect gift is from you, the Father of lights, in whom there isn't even a shadow of turning, not even a little teeny bit. You're always the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Father God, you are faithful and true in all that time, Lord. Father, your, your promises are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. If we would just appropriate them, Lord, if we would just apprehend and grab on and hold tight, Father God, to the end. Lord, we know that evil is rampant right now, God, but you are good and you're in control and you know the end from the beginning. Your waves are so much higher than our waves and they're past finding out. So we trust you, Lord, in these days of confusion. We know that we don't have to look down. We don't have to look around. We don't have to look to each other. We can look to you, our Heavenly Father. You have everything. You hold it all in your hands and you're taking good care of us and of it, Lord, of this world because your end is in sight. And we love you. Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus. We look for that day when you walk on the earth, Lord. When you meet us in the clouds, Father, when we rule and reign with you, Lord God, we look forward to new bodies too. And we love you and praise you and bless you and worship you. In Jesus' precious name. And everyone said, Amen. amen. Love one another, guys.
Good evening, everybody. <laughs> How you guys doing today? What's that? Yeah, well, we got we got rid of the snake. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we got him. Cody. Cody got rid of him too. Yeah. Cody got bit on the finger too. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Dennis brought it up. I didn't bring it up. Anyway, remember last week I was telling you about um, the lady that asked me to pray for her daughter, and I prayed for Jennifer, and her name was J Julie or Juliet. And um, well, anyway, uh, she had the operation today, and everything came out successful, and so the mother was all happy and saying, thank you for praying and all that, So, which is good. So it's a good witness for... People know you're a Christian, and when things happen, they'll come up to you and ask you to pray for them, and it opens doors, and so it's, it's, um, it's good to let people know, so, except the NSA, I guess. But. <laughs> but we don't want to bring politics. We're not doing politics, so, um, okay, so... Today, the pastor is going to be talking about Joseph, and so I'm going to read a few verses here, and then he's going to come up and teach us. So he's going to be in Genesis 42, the end of 42, and, and I mean, end of 41 and some 42. I'm going to read just about seven verses in 42. When Jacob saw that there was grain in Egypt, Jacob said to his sons, why do you look at one another? And he said, indeed, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down to that place and buy, buy for us there, that we may live and not die. So Joseph's ten brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt. But Jacob did not send Joseph's brother Benjamin with his brothers, for he said, lest some calamity befall him. And the sons of Israel went to buy grain among those who journeyed, for the famine was in the land of Canaan. Now Joseph was governor over the land. And it was he who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brother came to him and bowed down before him with their faces to the earth. And Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them, but he acted as a stranger to them and spoke roughly to them. Then he said to them, where do you come from? And they said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. Okay, okay let's pray. Okay, Heavenly Father, thank you that um, we have the opportunity and the privilege to, to worship you and to praise you and to, to learn about you. Please anoint the pastor as he comes up and teaches us tonight. And we do give you all the glory and all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good evening, you guys. God is good. All the time, God is faithful. He's true. He's awesome. So we've spent a couple weeks. I had a great time of just relaxing and refreshing and doing what I used to do all the time in Santa Barbara, just laying on the beach. And God is good. <laughs> God is very good. Uh, just to get you back up to speed, though, we've been following the story of Joseph. When Joseph was young, he had dreams and seemed to indicate that one day that he would be a great man. But at home, he was just a little punk kid, <laughs> a little brother <coughs> who did nothing but bother his older brothers. And so one day, they sold him into slavery into Egypt, and he served for a while in the house of his master, Potiphar. But when Potiphar's wife began to make advances towards Joseph, and he continued to refuse her, he ended up being thrown into prison, falsely accused. In prison, God was still with Joseph, still working in his life. As he worked his way up inside the prison system until he was the favorite prisoner. And one day, Joseph found himself interpreting dreams of two of Pharaoh's chief men, the butler and the baker. 
And though he expected this would end up, he was hoping it would end up as an escape and get out of free jail card. It didn't. And he was forgotten. And he spent an additional two years in prison. Finally, when Pharaoh himself had a dream, needing an explanation, and the butler and the uh, baker were of no help, Joseph found himself before Pharaoh, even being promoted as the prime minister over all Egypt. If you recall, Pharaoh's dream was a message from God that there would be seven years of prosperity followed by seven years of famine. And so in chapter 41, we saw the prosperity begin right around verse 46. And verse 47 told us now in the seven plentiful years, the ground brought forth abundantly. And so they gathered up the food of the seven years and they laid the food in the cities. They stored it up. In verse 49, Joseph gathered very much grain and the sand or as the sand of the seas, until he stopped counting, for it was immeasurable. And so the nation was careful to save from their abundance instead of just going out and spending all their newfound wealth. But then there's something important that happened. Joseph had some sons. Two sons are born to him. And these names that are given to them are intended to teach us a lesson. Probably two of the most important principles that were present within the life of Joseph. Number one name was Manasseh. For God has made me forget all my toil and all my father's house, verse 51. Sold into slavery by his brothers, lied to and lied about by his boss's life, thrown into prison and forgotten. If anyone had a reason to be dysfunctional, it was Joseph for sure. Yet Manasseh, meaning the meaning of the word, the name Manasseh, Manasseh is forget. And so when you look at this as to what Joseph really is intending, what he's meaning, what he's saying, is he's saying, God made me forget the brothers who picked on me unfairly. He made me and caused me to forget the pit that I was thrown into cruelly. And he caused me to forget the dungeon I suffered in unjustly. And it's just like what Paul said. Paul said, this one thing I do, forgetting that which lies behind, I press on. I'm not going to let those things drag me down. I'm not going to let them hold me back, detract, or derail me. But I'm going to press on to the high calling of Christ Jesus, Philippians 3.13. Those who can't forget about their past walk, past events that were somewhat unsettling, they end up walking through life crippled. On the other hand, there is absolutely nothing that stops those who like Joseph and who, like Paul, forgot about that which they can't do anything about and they press on to the high calling, the high mark of Christ. For Joseph, we see here that it was toil, trouble, probably referring to his time as a slave and as a prisoner in the prison that he stayed in. The second thing we saw him mention here specifically was my father's house, which is the pain that he endured by being kidnapped and sold as a slave by his brothers. And so God here is causing him to forget two things. He's telling him, let it go, Joseph. No resentment, no bitterness, no remembrance of these things. Their key to avoiding bitterness, he tells them, is, is forgiveness, to forgive them. And we see in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 34, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. We see it pretty clear later that somehow... Not when they came there, not when he saw them, but sometime before they even made the journey to Egypt in order to get some wheat and get some food for the family. It appears as if Joseph was already forgiving his brothers. In Genesis chapter 50, verse 19, it says, Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? Is it my turn to be God this week? No, it's not. But as for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day. In other words, for it to happen this way, it's to save many people alive. Now, therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and he spoke kindly to them. He had forgotten it. He had forgiven his brothers. The second son's name is Ephraim, which means I shall... Be doubly fruitful. And there in verse 52 it says, And the name 
of the second he called Ephraim, for God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my afflictions. Ephraim means fruitful, doubly fruitful. And I find the order of Joseph's sons somewhat intriguing if you think about it. Because we will never be fruitful until we are quitting that living in the past. As long as we live in the past, we're not going to be fruitful in our life. For Joseph, it was though, or through this time of affliction, that God brought him to the place of being fruitful. When you look at the book of Hebrews, it was written to be an encouragement to the believers that were going through some very difficult times, trials, persecutions, and troubles. But he writes in chapter 12 of Hebrews, verse 11, Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, after it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. To those that have been trained by it. That word gymnazo in the Greek, it speaks of the word that we get ours from, gymnasium. But when you look at this word, you think of it as getting a workout, or you should be. Exercising hard and working up a sweat. If you learn to discipline yourself, and if you learn to exercise, there is a benefit to your physical body. Your heart becomes stronger. Your muscles become stronger. Your stamina increases. You sleep better at night. Your body burns more calories, and you even cause your good cholesterol levels to go up. But it only comes if you work at regular exercise. We may learn to appreciate these things, but no one enjoys them, he says. They're not pleasant for the time being. But in the end, we look back on them, and there's a greater appreciation for those difficult times. Things that are really necessary for our maturity. Things that are very necessary for us to, to grow up. Chastening is painful, not pleasurable. But if you're willing to go to the gym, if you're willing to work out with it, you will receive a benefit for your life, spiritually and physically. You'll receive that benefit. And the peaceable fruit of righteousness will be given to you. And so the question needs to be asked, are you aware yet of how your afflictions might be used by God to make you fruitful? Because we see it within the life of Joseph. Fruitfulness in our life is led to and brought to our lives through forgiveness. There's a direct connection between the two. And the blessings in Joseph's life seem to be expressed most in his sons. And the order of the sons was forgive and then fruitful. I'm not sure that you can be too fruitful in your land of affliction unless you learn to forgive and to forget and to move on and to let it go. We pick up then in chapter 41 and verse 53. And it says, Then at this point, the seven years of plenty, of blessing, which were in the land of Egypt, ended. Joseph was 30 years old when he first interpreted Pharaoh's dreams. It would put him now seven years later, making him 37 years of age. And the seven years of famine began to come, verse 54. As Joseph had said, the famine was in all lands. Just as the dearth of the famine was in all lands, so the seven-year tribulation will infect the entire planet. But all are in all the land of Egypt. There was bread. So in spite of this, what was taking place around really the world and affecting the entire planet as we see there in the land of Egypt was bread. And Egypt weathered the difficult days because under Joseph's direction, Egypt had bought and brought grain into the storehouse. In this is another reminder of another storehouse. In Malachi chapter 3 verse 10, he says, bring all ye the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. The principle, you know, you've got to remember that Joseph is a type of Christ. And we see several ways in which that is demonstrated as we go through these verses. But one of the ways, again, is the storing up. That we not just, you know, splurge or 
be unwise with that which God has given unto us. And so Malachi picks up on that. And just as the Egyptians were to bring their plenty to the granary in order that they would later be able to be fed physically, we are to bring our tithe to the place wherein we are fed spiritually. Now, some may protest and they might say, well, wait a minute, we're no longer under the law. And tithing is the law. If we remember anything about Genesis chapter 14, we find that the tithing and the principle of tithing was given even before the law came. It preceded it by many years. And it also postdates the law as well, the scripture does, because Jesus said the tithe was not to be left undone in Luke chapter 11, verse 42. Later on, Paul will go on to tell the church at Corinth, bring to the storehouse of that which the Lord has blessed them. And so it's because of the tithe and because it is God's that he who doesn't give the first 10% of whatever he makes, whatever the Lord blesses him with, that Malachi in chapter 3, verse 9 says that we rob God. But he says he who tithes will be rewarded to such a degree that there won't be room to contain it. According to studies that are done, not only would every church and ministry and charitable work be free of debt, but every hungry person in the world would be fed if believers would simply not rob God of the tithe. You notice a couple other things in verse 11. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. This is Malachi 3, chapter 3, verse 11. And so not only does God reward the one who brings him the tithe, but he rebukes the forces which seek to devour him. When I've ignored this principle and disobeyed the command to tithe, I've experienced exactly what Haggai said would happen when he wrote in chapter 1, verse 6, you've sown much and you bring in little. You eat, but you have not enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You're clothed in yourself, but there's none worn. And he that earns a wage, earns a wage, but he puts it in bags full of holes and it runs out. The principle he's trying to say is that you can't outgive God. And it's not about God you know, needing necessarily your money. But he says if we handle it and approach it in the wrong way, finances get devoured and they're eaten up necessar- un- needlessly when we fail to tithe. The second thing that we can see is that all the nations shall call you blessed. Why? Because they'll see how God blesses those that honor him. He says, for you shall be a delightful lamb, says the Lord of hosts. Malachi 3, verse 12. And so not only does tithing bring reward to us, not only does it bring a uh, rebuke to the devourer, it also ushers in revival to those around so they can see firsthand the blessing, and the goodness of God in our lives. Tithing is not God's way to raise money, guys. That's not how he raises money. It's how he raises kids, us. Because you see, every time the offering basket passes by, it's an opportunity for you and for me to let go of a portion of my earthliness. It's an opportunity for us to let go of our greediness or our selfishness. Jesus said that wherever your treasure is, there will our heart be also. So God doesn't need our money, guys, but he desires our heart. Therefore, when we seek first the kingdom of God and we invest our treasure therein, then our heart's going to follow it. Verse 55. So when all the land of Egypt, we're back in Genesis now, chapter 41, verse 55. When all the land of Egypt was famished, then the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. To whom will people cry during the tribulation? Initially, they'll cry to the Antichrist. And it's kind of interesting as you're seeing how people are being conditioned even now to cry out to the government, to cry out to the leaders in order to give to them what is their need at that present time. But guys, we need to be dependent wholly, completely on the Lord. And we're seeing people do that. We're seeing some folks that are really standing up and they're taking the the punishment. You know, some do it for Christ. Some do it because they're just principled that way. The most recent is the L.A. Police Department. I'm noticing that they're rebelling against the dictate of the chief and those that are in the uh, command uh, of mandatory vaccination. But as you look at these things, we see 
and it's some similarities, really. And our treasure needs to be in him. Our foundation, foundation needs to be Christ. And so they came and they cried to Pharaoh as they will to the Antichrist. In verse 55, then Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, go to Joseph. Unlike Pharaoh, Antichrist is not going to direct people to the greater than Joseph. Nevertheless, he will know in his soul that Jesus is their only hope. Whatever he says to you to do, do. So concerning this lack of bread, Pharaoh says unto Joseph, what he says, do it. Concerning the lack of wine, Mary said to her son, whatever he says or they say, then you do it. And then verse 56, the famine was over all the face of the earth. And Joseph opened up the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians. And the famine became severe in the land of Egypt. And so all countries came to Joseph in Egypt to buy grain because the famine was severe in all the land. This is a key component to understanding what the tribulation is all about. Because without question, the greatest revival in history will take place during the seven-year tribulation period. And even though you won't be here at the time, your witness to those around you, whether it be the books that you gave to them, the tapes that you left them, you know, in places that they would obviously find them, the words that you shared with them, those things, man, when this mass group of people disappears, believers, Christians at the rapture, their, their questions are going to flood their hearts and their minds. And in the famished condition of their soul, they'll begin to realize that the key is not really to cry to Pharaoh, not to cry out to the government leaders, not to cry out to Joseph Biden or to Fauci or to any of these guys, but it's to cry out to Jesus, to run to Jesus as fast as they can. Now in chapter 42, verse 1, when Jacob saw that there was grain in Egypt, Jacob said to his sons, why do you look at one another? <laughs> you know, it's like a dad, normal thing a dad would say, what are you guys doing? Get busy, get going. There's grain to be had and you got to get there. And so as the famine continued, word reached Jacob that there was supplies there in Egypt. And he said, verse 2, indeed, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down to that place and buy for us there that we might live and not die. Although Jacob's sons will try to buy bread from Joseph, they're not going to be able to because Joseph is a type of Christ whose provision of salvation cannot be bought. Isaiah 55 verse 1 says, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no mercy, come, buy and eat. Yes, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. This is a great picture of what faith is all about. Jacob had heard that there's food in Egypt. He hasn't seen it. He's just heard about it. And so he asked his son to do something as a result of it. And this is what saving faith is all about. The Bible says in Acts chapter 16, verse 31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Then again in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Amen. You say amen. You hear that Jesus is the answer to life and then you learn to trust in him. People say to me from time to time, how can I trust in God in a God that I can't see? And the truth is we trust in things that we don't understand all the time. Most of us in here would not fully understand all the mechanics of how a gasoline engine works, but that doesn't stop you from filling up the tank and driving. You say, well, wait a minute. I may not understand it, but there are others that do. And though I don't understand it, I see that it works. And that's the same thing with Jesus. You may not understand why believing in Jesus will save you. You may not fully have it laid out in your mind, but there are others that do. And there are plenty of people in this room that can show those individuals, how Jesus has worked in their life. And that's you. That's your job. That's what God has called us to do. Verse 3, so Joseph's ten brothers 
They went down to buy grain in Egypt. Ten brothers speaks of the number ten, the law. The law always wants to purchase salvation through the expenditure of its own energy. That's why people have a propensity to think that they can earn God's favor, but it can't be done. You know, they want to work for the, God's blessing. They want to try to purchase salvation. It doesn't work that way. And so, but Jacob did not send Joseph's brother Benjamin as he sends the rest of the brothers. For he said, lest some calamity befall him. Benjamin was the full brother, if you remember, of Joseph. The only other son of Jacob's beloved wife, Rachel. And so Jacob's refusal to send him with his ten half-brothers indicates that perhaps Jacob had strong suspicions concerning what had happened to Joseph years earlier. He doesn't really, it's, it appears that he doesn't really trust them with Benjamin. Verse 5, And the sons of Israel went to buy grain among those who journeyed, for the famine was in the land of Canaan. Now Joseph was governor over the land, and it was he who sold to all the people of the land. Because Joseph had unlimited resources. There was food available for all who came to him. He had plenty. Because his mercy, our Father, our Lord, because his mercy and graces are inexhaustible. And again, you see the type here. Jesus is unlimited in his resources to bless you and to bless me. He will supply all our needs according to his riches. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. And his riches are without limitation. Verse 6, And Joseph's brother came and bowed before him with their faces to the earth. At the end of the tribulation period, when the nation of Israel realizes that Jesus is the Messiah, Mashiach, she will bow to him, even as Joseph's brothers are bowing at this point before him. And Joseph, verse 7, saw his brothers. Notice, he recognized them. But he acted as a stranger to them. Joseph knew and he felt a great love for his brothers. But he didn't make himself known unto them, spiritually or physically. For 2,000 years, Jesus has looked on at the nation Israel with compassion. Yet because blindness has come upon Israel, Romans 11, verse 25, she doesn't see Jesus. That's why you can open up the scripture to a Jew and show them how the prophecies have all been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And yet, for the most part, a veil will remain over their eyes. You remember the statement, we don't want you to rule over us. We don't want you to have any part of us, the Jews said concerning Christ. And so Jesus has withdrawn himself from them. And just as he withdraws from anyone who says, I don't want you in my life, I don't want you as my Lord. Does God still love Israel? Absolutely. Absolutely. Does he still have a plan for Israel? Yes. For when her eyes are finally open and she asks him, where did you get those wounds? He won't say, I got them from a bunch of strangers. No, he's going to say, I got them in the house of my friends. Zechariah 13, verse 6. And so as a stranger to them, verse 7 he says, and spoke roughly to them. In other words, Joseph spoke a different language to them. He spoke the language of the Egyptians. He had a, we'll see later, an interpreter. The Jewish people say the New Testament was written in a language they don't understand. Oh, they, they understand Greek intellectually, but they just didn't accept it theologically. So why would Joseph speak a language his brothers didn't understand? I think for the same reason that the Lord does. It's called conviction. You see, a person needs to realize he's a sinner because no one is saved by the Lord until they realize their need for the Lord. And to that end, the law was given as a rough schoolmaster, wrapping people, so to speak, on the knuckles, showing them they're sinners and making it clear to them that they don't measure up. Galatians chapter 3, verse 24. People often say to me, you know, I, I read the Bible and I don't like it because it doesn't make me feel good. In fact, it makes me feel bad. Well, good. 
I had a, a, a good friend over the years. I've known him for most of my life. And he was fellowshipping for a, quite a while at the church. And he used to come out and he just said, man, Joe, that tears me up. I, I don't like that. You see, he wanted to come for warm fuzzies. He wanted to feel good when he left. And oftentimes, we don't, that's not what we need. We don't need to feel good. We need to feel convicted. We need to understand what it is that God might be wanting to do within our life. And so, I have to understand the principle of Luke 7, 47, where it says, the one who is forgiven much loves much. And because of that, I will not love the Lord much until I realize how badly I've blown it and how much I've been forgiven. Those who don't have a passion for the Lord are typically those who don't realize what kind of sinners are, how bad of sinners they are. But when they understand the price paid, the price that was paid for them on the cross, the work that Jesus did on their behalf, the mercy and grace that has been lavished upon their life, their love for him grows immensely. Then he said to them, where do you come from? This is Joseph speaking to the brothers. And they said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. And so Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. And I think of this in really the terms, and you say, well, how in the world could they not recognize him? I know, I know it's been some time, but man, it hasn't been that long. But they don't. They don't recognize him. And he's not acting as if he's surprised to see them. I mean, he knew that they were alive. But the last thing they expected to ever see, I think, was Joseph alive. But think about it. He's probably wearing strange Egyptian clothing while they're wearing the same old Hebrew garb. They have the same long hair. They have the same long beards that he had last seen them with. Joseph has an Egyptian haircut, most likely at this point, clean-shaven. If you ever know when a person who had real long hair one day and they get it shaved, it's kind of hard to recognize them. They're also speaking Hebrew. And we'll see, like I said, in chapter 42, verse 23, Joseph is speaking Egyptian through an interpreter. And they may not even be able to hear his voice so they could recognize it. He might be behind a curtain or down someplace where they can't see him. And so verse 9 tells us that Joseph remembered the dreams which he had dreamed about them. And he said to them, you are spies. You've come to see the nakedness of the land. You've come to spy out the land so you can take our stores. You're trying to check out what's weakened and, and stuff in order that you might plan your military strategy. Joseph had, you remember, two dreams. Genesis 37, verse 5. The first dream was about his brother's sheaves bowing down before Joseph's sheaf. What seemed like something that was somewhat audacious, a proud dream, was actually a prophecy of the future. The bowing of the sheaves. The sheaves are bundles of grain. The brothers are now bowing before Joseph in order to buy grain from him. And then remember the second dream was about the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars bowing down before him. And note that Jacob's, or Joseph's second dream involves all his brothers as well as his parents. Even though Joseph currently has 10 brothers bowing before him, the complete fulfillment hasn't happened yet. And it won't until the entire family comes down to Egypt. So what's the connection between remembering the dreams and speaking harshly to his brothers? Well, Joseph's harsh words are aimed at fulfilling the second dream. That is, getting the rest of the family to come down to Egypt at this time. He's going to try to get his brother, Benjamin, first. And instead, and if you remember, Joseph and Benjamin are born of the same mother. And really, they're the only two from Rachel. And so, again, there is that bond. And I think that when you look at this, you kind of get the feeling that Joseph is concerned about Benjamin, wants to make sure that Benjamin is safe. But 
what I find interesting is that he's, he's telling his brothers not who he is, but he's seeking to find out what kind of guys, what kind of men are these guys? Have they changed? Have they been convicted? Has God gotten a hold of their hearts? What's more important is, can they be trusted? Can he trust these guys? Are they still murderous, greedy men? Or is it possible that they could have changed? And they said to him, the brothers, no, my Lord, but your servants have come to buy food. We are all one man's sons. We are honest men. We're true men, they said. Doesn't really mix with what Joseph knows. What have they done to Joseph? Are they really honest? Are they righteous? Are they true men? In our fleshly condition, in our fallen state, we say, you know, we're pretty good. We're true. And that is the reason for the ordeal that follows. Joseph had to show his brothers that they were not true men. And so he says, your servants are not spies. The brothers did. But Joseph said to them, no, but you've come to see the nakedness of the land. And they said, your servants are 12 brothers, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And in fact, the youngest is with our father today, and one is no more. We're not spies, the brothers are trying to get it through to Joseph. We just came for the food. And again, I find it interesting that they admit to the stranger that they had a 12th brother, Joseph. They had no reason to do that, but they admit that. But Joseph, verse 14, said to them, It is as I spoke unto you, saying, You are spies. In this manner you shall be tested. By the life of Pharaoh you shall not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here. If you're really telling the truth, have your youngest brother come here. It's test time. It's final exam time. And I think this gives us a little bit of a clue as to what Joseph is really up to. It could be that Joseph is just getting a little revenge on his brothers. After all, they were responsible for him being a slave and being in Egypt. But personally, I think he's testing his brothers. Not to see if they are spies, but to again, see what kind of men they are. At this point, Joseph is now 39 years old, hasn't seen his brothers for 22 years. The last he knew, his brothers were dirty, rotten scoundrels that had sold him for a few bucks. It also seems that Joseph is concerned about, again, like I said, Benjamin. It seems initially that he's trying to get his brothers to bring Benjamin to him where he can perhaps protect Benjamin and keep an eye on him because of that bond between the two of them. As far as Joseph knows, they've already killed him. In the process, Joseph is going to find out if his brothers have changed over the years. But I think this is a place for learning the value of testing others in certain situations, of testing others in the area of forgiveness. I think there should be a difference designated between forgiving people and trusting them again. We're commanded to forgive others, yes. We need to learn to let go of resentment and bitterness because that will haunt you. But I'm not sure this means that because we forgive a person that we automatically trust them. When a person's been abused by another in some way, I think the goal is to learn to forgive, but this doesn't mean the person to give to them the key to your apartment and to open up in that way. It doesn't always mean that. I see this life are this, this principle in the life of the Apostle Paul when a young man named John Mark butted heads with him. On Paul's first missionary trip, John Mark bailed out and abandoned the team. Later, Paul had the opportunity to take Mark on another journey. And in Acts chapter 15, verse 37, it said, Now Barnabas was determined to take them or with them, John called Mark. But Paul insisted that they should not take him with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia. 
and had not gone with them to the work. Then the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. And so Barnabas took Mark and he sailed to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. And yet, as you look at the story as it unfolds, later on, Paul watched Mark, watched him grow in the Lord and grow in faithfulness. His opinion of Mark changed. And 2 Timothy 4.11 says, Get Mark, bring him with you, for he is useful to me for the ministry. There's a usefulness there. Verse 16, send one of you, back in Genesis, send one of you and let them bring your brother. And you shall be kept in prison, that your words may be tested to see whether there's any truth in you. Or else by the life of Pharaoh, surely you are spies. So again, why does Joseph want to see Benjamin? I suggest it's because he wants to know if his brothers had done to Benjamin what he, they did to Joseph. But I find it interesting that Benjamin was only one of Joseph's brothers who had no part in selling him into slavery. Verse 17, so he put them all together in prison. So now he begins by putting them all together in prison for three days, held in captivity. So too, because in God's economy, one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 8. The Jewish people are entering into their third day in the captivity beginning with the time that they were driven from their homeland in 1026 B.C. And so Joseph said to them then on the third day, Jesus died 2,000 years, two days ago. I believe at the breaking of the third day, the third millennium, he'll come again to establish his kingdom. Guys, we're closer than we have ever been before. And with all the recent last year and a half, activity. We've got more proof of that than we've had in a long time. Maybe perhaps ever. But we've got to be rooted. We've got to be grounded. We've got to be focused on Jesus Christ. And so Joseph said to him on the third day, do this and live for I fear God. Interesting statement. He says, I fear Elohim is the word he used, which should have startled his brothers. Elohim being a Hebrew rather than an Egyptian God. They should have thought, man, there's something, something odd about this. Something about this man standing here that we don't quite understand. But they couldn't get past the fact that he was a Gentile. It's the same way with the Jewish people not being able to figure you and I out. You claim to know our God, they say, but where are your kosher foods and your prayer shawls and all the things that go along with it? Verse 19, if you're honest men, let one of your brothers be confined to your prison house, but you go and carry grain for the famine of your house. It appears that after three days, Joseph has a change of heart. And he decides that only one brother needs to be held. And he exercises a bit of grace in how he tests the brothers. Notice verse 20. And bring your youngest brother to me, so your words will be verified, and you shall not die. And so they did so. And then they said to one another, we are truly, now this is interesting. They begin to talk among themselves in the Hebrew language. And they haven't even left the presence of Joseph. And they said to one another, we are truly guilty concerning our brother. For we saw the anguish of his soul when he pleaded with us and we would not hear. Therefore, this distress has come upon us. We're guilty. Joseph's brothers are guilty. They're saying that amongst themselves, not realizing that Joseph could understand what they were saying. Our brother cried out and we didn't respond. Our brother was in anguish and we didn't care. We are not true men. And now we're paying the price. It's amazing how quickly they associated the things that they had done back to sin and their disobedience. Something that I'm sure was haunting them for a long time. Verse 22, And Reuben answered them and said, Didn't I speak to you 
saying, do not sin against this boy, and you would not listen. Therefore, behold, his blood is now required of us. Reuben says of Joseph, his blood is now upon us. Said Israel of Jesus in Matthew 27, let his blood be upon us. What they don't know is that Joseph is hearing all of this. They have no reason to be putting on a show of fake repentance. Joseph must be amazed to hear the change that has happened within his brother's lives. But herein you see a dealing with guilt. How do you deal with guilt? You know, guilt is something that motivates people. Elizabeth Brenton, 13-year-old Girl Scout, explaining how she sold 11,200 boxes of cookies. She said, quote, you have to look people in the eye and make them feel guilty. It's a 13-year-old Girl Scout. But it's long been a truth within psychology that the number one major problem in counseling is dealing with guilt. Number two, I think, is resentment. When people don't deal, though, with their guilt, they develop neurosis. They do crazy things trying to punish themselves for what they've done wrong, trying to displace that guilt. Joseph's brothers have started to become paranoid. They're starting to get to the point where every bad thing that happens is linked to their sin. You know, there's a school of psychology that tries to deal with this by simply talking you out of your guilt. Talking you out of your guilt. The only way we know it is chapter 8, verse 1. There's therefore no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Sometimes we come up with silly ways to deal with it. There was a man that wrote a note and put it with a check in an envelope and he mailed it. And it said this on the note, Gentlemen, enclosed you'll find a check for $150. I cheated on my income tax return last year and I've not been able to sleep since. If I still have trouble sleeping, I will send you the rest. Sincerely a taxpayer. <laughs> There's some people that feel that they need to pay off God and they'll do things like putting an extra big check in the offering to make up for what they've done. Now, I'm not necessarily wanting you to stop doing that, but, but it's interesting what it is that motivates us. So what do you do with your guilt? The Bible teaches us what to do with it. Psalms 32, verse 1, says, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. Selah. I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. So if we confess our sins to God, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But they did not know that Joseph understood him, for he spoke to them through an interpreter. They didn't know Joseph was taking in this whole scene, this whole conversation, just as the Jewish people don't realize that Jesus is listening to their conversation. And he turned himself away from them and he wept. It was too much for him, it was overwhelming. Following their final rejection of him, Jesus himself looked over the city of Jerusalem and Luke 19 verse 41 tells us that he wept. Here Joseph does the same thing. Quite touched at his brother's sense of remorse. So why does Joseph take Simeon? Simeon was one of the brothers known for his temper. Perhaps he was one of the brothers that wanted to kill Joseph. Nevertheless, he keeps Simeon. Verse 24 goes on to say, Then he returned to them again and talked to them. And he took Simeon from, out, from amongst them and bound him before their eyes. It's interesting that Simeon means hearing. Nine brothers will return to the promised land, but they'll go without hearing. Concerning Jesus, Isaiah said of the Jews, 
In hearing you shall hear, but not understand. In seeing you shall not perceive. The same thing remains true for today. For in May 1948, the Jews returned to Israel, but they returned without Simeon because they still can't hear Jesus. Can't hear what he's telling them. Verse 25, then Joseph gave a command to fill the sacks with grain of the brothers and to restore every man's money to his sack. Now he's, it seems like he's messing with them, but he's, there's something to this. But to give them also provisions for the journey, thus he did for them. And so Joseph didn't accept his brother's money. Neither would Jesus accept our efforts to purchase either our own salvation or his continued favor. He won't do it. God will be a debtor to no man. Grace isn't the starting point of salvation. It's the only point of salvation. And so they loaded their donkeys with the grain and they departed from there. But as one of them opened his sack and gave his donkey feed at the encampment, he saw his money. And there it was in the mouth of his sack. And so he said to his brothers, my money has been restored. And there it is in my sack. I mean, this is a big deal. Their hearts failed them. And they were afraid, saying to one another, what is this that God has done? Blame it on God. As did Joseph to his brothers, even though they've been scattered, God has faithfully provided silver for his people. To such a degree that one of the reasons the Third Reich rose to power was in reaction to the prosperity of the Jews in Europe. And so here the brothers discover their money has been returned. And they're worried about it. First brother has received and noticed what was going on. The others will a little bit later here. I mean, wouldn't you love that though? You get in the car, you go to Sam's or you go to Costco. You fill your cart. You just don't think about it. You make your way out and you're loading up the car and all of a sudden you see a big old bundle of cash for the exact amount that you spent. That would be great, I think. But here they're discovering that the money's been returned and they are worried about it, concerned about it because they feel like they're being set up because they haven't got a clean conscience. But Joseph seems to be doing something good towards his brothers. Perhaps again, he's testing them on how to handle or how they will handle the money, but I think I see a picture of grace here. Romans chapter 2 and verse 4. It says, Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that it's the goodness of God that leads you to repentance? It's the goodness of God. This is the way that God deals with us, giving us wonderful things that we don't deserve. And so Joseph may be testing him. But here he's testing him with kindness. Verse 29. Then they went to Jacob their father in the land of Canaan. And they told him all that had happened to them. Saying the man who is Lord of the land spoke roughly to us. And took us for spies of the country. But we said to him we are honest men. We are not spies. We are twelve brothers sons of our father. One is no more and the youngest is with our father this day in the land of Canaan. Then the man, the Lord of the country, said unto this, By this I will know that you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers here with me. Take food for the famine to your households and be gone. And bring your youngest brother to me, so I shall know that you are not spies, but that you are honest men. I will grant your brother to you, and you may trade in the land. Then it happened as they emptied their sacks that surprisingly each man's bundle of money was in his sack. And when they and their father saw the bundles of money, they were afraid. The hearts of Jacob and his sons must have stopped when they discovered not one piece of incriminating evidence, but ten pieces of incriminating evidence. And Jacob, their father, said unto them, You have bereaved me. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. And you want to take Benjamin? Notice he says, All these things 
are against me. I want you to notice here who's talking. Because it's not Israel, is it? Israel, remember we talked about that? When God gave him that new name. And it really was a, a description really of his character. And when Israel was speaking, there was great hope. There was righteousness. There was, there was not these things that we see happening with Jacob. But here Jacob is speaking. And we see Jacob, their father, said unto them, You have bereaved me. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. And you want to take Benjamin. All these things are against me. Notice it's not Israel talking. It's not governed by God talking. It's not governed by God who declares all these things are against me. Oh, oh man. It's Jacob. Everything is against me. He cries. But that's not true Jacob. Jacob, hang in there for another chapter and you'll see that all these things are working out gloriously. And you'll see that as we look at these things next week, guys, all things work together for good for those that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. There are certain things that we just don't know. Like how do honeybees fly when theoretically their wings are too short and too light to support them when carrying pollen? There are also some things that we can't know, like the day or the hour of the rapture, Matthew 25, verse 13. Or who will be in heaven, Matthew 13, verses 24 through 30. There's also several things that we should know, like the fact that Jesus is coming again, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13. And the manifestation of the gifts, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. But there's one thing that we do know, and that's the promise that's been given to us. Paul writes in Romans 8, verse 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. How do we know that? Because it's in the Bible. Yeah. Well, okay, what about the guys in Rome whom Paul was writing? They had never heard of Romans 8, 28. How then could Paul assume that they knew its truth? Come back next week and you'll find out. Father, we just love you, Lord, and we thank you for, Lord, just the clarity of your word and just the things that, that Joseph went through, the things that the brothers went through, the tests that were placed upon their lives. Lord, Father, they, they just, you know, how gracious you are. Lord, when you allow things to happen in our lives that test us in this way, that push us to the limit, that chastening that is no fun at all. But Lord, the, the end result is just overwhelming in how, Lord, you work in our life and you can bring out the character and, Lord, just the things, the attributes in our life that can bring not only glory to you, but, Lord, allow us to be a witness of your awesome love, grace, and mercy, and power, and just your presence in our life, Lord, how you give to us a heart, how you give to us, you know, just the ways that you have that enable us to be a living testimony for you, just shining forth your glory, your goodness, Lord, and having nothing to do with us. It's not about us, but Lord, it's what you've done. It's the work that you've done on the cross. It's Jesus Christ and him crucified. And it's just an amazing thing, Lord, to see the Bible just <laughs> roll out the way that you have caused it to. And just the connections, Lord, and the things that one thing after another that back each other up things that we can look at and say the truths that, Father, you have established and just the righteousness, Lord, and, and Lord, just the, the beauty, you know, of, of your work, your word to us and for us, Lord. 
And so, Father, we just love you tonight. We thank you, Lord, for the story of Joseph and, Lord, the, the work that you did in his heart to, Lord, forgive and to be fruitful because of it. You know, maybe perhaps the opposite of what a lot of people, especially in this world, would tell us. Oh, you should have got even. You should have got revenge. And so often we hear about that. All that ends up in, Lord, is road rage and, you know, other things where it just is compounded and it becomes worse and maybe even fatal. But Lord, you have called us to be a witness for this world. Father, to be that person that, Lord, people could look at and say, why aren't you going crazy? Why aren't you impacted by COVID-19? Why aren't you more angry at the news and angry at these people that are obviously lying? Why aren't, why aren't you this and why aren't you that? Because, God, you are faithful. And you've given us life that we might live in a way that would glorify and honor you. But not just that, that would bring peace to us. And Lord, would bring joy everlasting and full of glory. God, you've given us all things pertaining to life and to godliness. All we've got to do is mine it from your word. You've given it such a rich, rich, rich field for us to pick from, Lord. So, Father, plant these things, these principles in our hearts. And, Lord, help us to, by your Holy Spirit, apply them to our life on a daily basis. For, God, we love you so dearly. And we just want to be what you want us to be, what you're trying and seeking and hoping to mold us and to shape us into, Lord. We love you and we thank you now, Lord. We just lift this before you, lift these these things before you, Lord. We ask God for just your rich touch upon our lives. In Jesus' name, everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you guys.